So we're going to be in 1 Samuel 15 tonight. Now I know Pastor John has been taking us through a study of, of the life of David. So this isn't specifically about David, of course. Uh, getting the call at, at whatever time it was, 3 o'clock this afternoon, I certainly didn't have time to just sort of roll right into a David study. But, um, um, but this is a study I've done before, and, I, and, and, and it's not about David necessarily, but during his time, and, and, uh, and an indirect connection to David. So in my Bible, it's 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're just going to look at the first couple of verses. But in my Bible, at the top it says, uh, Saul spares King Agag. Um, but I, I've entitled this sermon, Death to the Flesh. But uh, another, perhaps less uh, gruesome title than that, uh, is Partial Obedience. So and you'll see as we work, work through this a little bit, how both um, um, t sermon titles apply. So we know Saul, King Saul that is, we're in the Old Testament, so we're talking about King Saul. We know King Saul was a man who began well, who had the anointing of God. He, he had the call of God on his life. And I know I told you to turn to, to 1 Samuel 15. And if you choose to, I'm just going to go to the left a couple pages to 1 Samuel 10. And just to, to, to show you, if you don't remember, how Saul began. In 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, it says, And the Spirit, this is when he was going to be anointed king. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and turn and be turned into another man. That's what Saul's told. Be, the Spirit of God will come upon him, and he'll be turned into another man. Does that sound familiar? Sound like Saul might have been born again, right? So, and then jump down to verse 9. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. Who doesn't want another heart? Saul got one, right? Another heart. And all, those, and all those signs came to pass that day. And jumped down to 11. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets. And the people said to one another, What is this that the, he has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Like basically they're saying, Who is this dude? What happened to the Saul I used to know? You know, and all of us can probably testify to that. Hopefully, we can testify to that. The people who used to know us now look at us and say, what, who are you? You're somebody different. So, but this is how Paul started out. This is how Paul started out. And then jump over to verse 21. And it says, When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near to their families, the family of Matri had chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen to be king. But when they sought him, he could not be found. You remember this, do you remember this episode? It couldn't be, he couldn't be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further. He, has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment. And he's like, there he is. He's, he's over there behind the 55-gallon drums. Like, that's, that, that was the picture, right? So they ran and brought, brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than the other people from the shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see whom the Lord has chosen? That there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. So I, I, I remind you of that. I know you know that story already. But I remind you of that just to remind you of who saw where he came from. He was, he was humble. He was, he, was, he was in submission to God when, he, when the Spirit came upon him in his, in his beginnings. Okay? That's how he started out. So back to 15. Um, he began well. He had anointing of God and he had the call of God on his life like we just saw. But, but his, his flaws ultimately would destroy him as we, as we know the life of Saul. So the, we have Samuel, right? So we saw Samuel there. You know, you know, you know that was Samuel who anointed him. And, and Samuel is with him through, through his, his reign. Samuel is with him. And Samuel is his... his Chief advisor. It's his, his chief. The Lord speaks to Samuel. Samuel speaks to Saul. Who wouldn't want? Who who wants a Samuel? Anybody want a Samuel? I want a Samuel in my life. I want somebody who's telling me exactly what God's saying. You know, I need that kind of interpreter. So Saul had that. Saul had that person in his life. He had Samuel. Samuel continued to assist. And think about all the all the mistakes Samuel. The the the, the, the times he he realized Saul was out of God's will, not doing what God wanted him to do. But Samuel was there. Samuel was faithful to him, and he guided and assisted Paul through his through his time through his reign. But Saul proved in the end to want to only heed his own desires. And that's what we're going to see in this passage. He wanted to heed his own, not the desires of God for his life, his own desires. He sought after his own desires. So let's read. I'm just going to read through the first nine verses of 1 Samuel 15. And then we'll go back and, and kind of look at each verse for a couple minutes. So it says there, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Just like we read a minute ago. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish what Amalek did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tahalim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a, city, to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Malachites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. So back in verse 1, Saul, Samuel reminds Saul, like, he basically says, remember, I was there, I was the one that God told, God told me to anoint you king. I was there, I've been with you all this time. So he listened to me. He's basically, you know, like we do with our kids, you grab them by the face, like, listen, I'm talking to you. That's kind of the picture I get Samuel's talking to Saul in that case, in this case. And Saul had already made numerous mistakes at this point as a leader of Israel, but the Lord sends Samuel to give him yet another opportunity to do something right. You know, we get that too. We get more opportunities. You know, God is the God of a thousand chances. You know, he's not just the God of another chance. He's God of a thousand chances. And, and, and uh, I, I know it's a cliche. You probably heard the, the, the old Christian ease anecdote of, of the, the guy who was on the roof of his flooding. You know, the flood was moving in. The flood waters were rising. He's on the roof, right? And the lady, the person comes by in a rowboat and says, come on, jump in. No, no, the Lord told me he'd save me. The motorboat comes by. Come on, jump in, buddy. The waters are rising. No, no, the Lord told me he saved me. The waters are up on the roof. He only has a little patch of roof to sit on now. And the helicopter comes and the guy lowers a ladder and says, get on, come on. And no, no, the Lord said this, he's going to save me. And he perishes in the waters. And he gets to heaven and he says, Lord, what are you doing? You told me you were going to save me. He said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter, man. What were you waiting for? <laughs> so the Lord does that for us too. He gives us opportunity. He sends messengers. He gives us opportunity after opportunity to walk wisely and to live successfully. He provides that for us. That's what it's, and that, that's the case here. Samuel is coming to Saul, giving him another opportunity to do the right thing, to do the next right thing. But there is an end to these opportunities to do right. Like I said, he is the God, you know, his mercies are new every day. We know that's a, a, a true principle. He, he is the God of a thousand chances. That's a true principle. But there's also a principle we see in the Bible, and it's part of his character, and it's kind of one of those parts of his character that sometimes we don't want to think about. But we see it throughout the Old Testament. An end comes. At some point, there's, there's an end, and the Lord does do it in numerous occasions. He says, that's it. So I'm telling you, in my in my you know in my recovery from from my drug and alcohol addiction as an early Christian and kept stumbling back into it, falling back into it, this principle that I could go out one more time and not come back got me sober. That the Lord has that in His character to say that's it. It seems to be more of His character to you know where, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more, of course. But there is part of his character where he says, that's it. So, that scared me enough to, it scared me sober. So, um, and that's a good thing, right? So ultimately, Saul just doesn't get it. And his poor decisions do destroy him, as we're going to see. As we look at Saul's plight, we must do what Saul did not do. And that's take heed to God's word. In other words, listen to what God is telling us. He had... One, in one sense, we could say he had an advantage. He had a living, breathing per prophet who could tell him directly what God said. But on the other sense, we have the advantage because we have the living, breathing word of God at our disposal. We want to know what to do. It's right here. It's all the answers to whatever's going on with you are right here. I know you know that. Just reminding you. 
So, verse 2 says, Then thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish the Amalek, uh, what Amalek did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man, woman, infant, nursing ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. The message is clear, right? I, it, maybe, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I'm pretty, it seems to me Saul is delivering a clear message, right? He's not beating around the bush. He's not hedging things. He's, he's saying, hey, here's what God's saying to do. Utterly destroy the Amalekites. That, that word, throughout this entire passage, it, does, it goes beyond verse 9, which is all we're probably going to get to tonight. Um, he, he, he uses, the word is used uh, in, in Hebrew. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know Hebrew, so I'm probably not going to, I'm probably going to butcher it, but harim which means to bring total and complete judgment. The word destroys, heharim. Total and complete judgment. That's what that means. And it used, it's used seven times in this account, in this passage. So you think God meant total and complete judgment? Yeah. Utterly destroy the Amalekites. Now look, this is hard to comprehend. You know, I, I remember reading this for the first time, or perhaps I didn't read it, maybe I even heard it preached or something for the, many years ago, and, and I thought, Wow, that's, that's like a harsh God. And, and, and maybe you've, you've had that interaction with people who don't believe or, or who are even atheists. And they say, why would a God of love totally kill people in the, in the, in the Old Testament like he did? And, 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 you know, in one sense, that's a fair question. And, and I guess the, the, the overall, the, the basic bottom line answer is because he's sovereign. But, but he has purposes in doing this. And um, he to, he, God told Samuel to tell Saul to bring total judgment against these people. So why? What did the Amalekites do that was so bad? Well, it's mentioned here that they uh, ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. So you don't have to turn there, but I'll just remind you. It's back in Exodus 17. Um, do you remember when Joshua and Moses, Joshua would be the general, Moses is sort of like, the president, you know, kind of, he was the leader. And, and, uh, and the Amalekites, he's, the Lord says, go against the Amalekites. So they go down in the valley. Joshua leads the army against the Amalekites. And Moses says, I'm going to go up on that hill overlooking the valley where the battle is taking place. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray. But it, this battle lasts a long time. And as he prayed and his hands were raised, the Israelites were succeeding in battle. But then, I mean, look, when I worship and I do this, I get tired. Like I'm like, oh my goodness, can, this is a long song. I can't do one more, one more refrain. Like my arms getting tired. But, but Saul. I mean, Moses was like this, and his arms are getting tired. He's drooping down. So then we see um, Aaron and her come along and lift him up. You know, it's a message there for us too. We all need, we all need help. We all need even prayer partners. He's praying. He needs people to come along and help him pray. You know, we all need that. So the hell. So we see the Amalekites there. And in that, in that passage, in, 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 in Exodus 17, at the end, the Lord uh, uh, reminds Moses that he will utterly destroy the Amalekites from the, from the earth. He says that at the end of that passage in, Ex in Exodus 17. I encourage you at some point to look at it. And then we also see them again in Deuteronomy 25. And this is more what the, this passage is referring to. We read how the Amalekites were the first people to attack Israel after they escaped from Egypt. I'm just going to flip there. You don't have to go there if you want to. It's in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19. I'll just read them. If you want to note it, you can. It says, remember, that Amal remember what Amalek did to you the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So when the nation of Israel is weak and vulnerable the Amalekites attack the back of the pack. As they were moving out of Egypt through the wilderness the Amalekites didn't it wasn't a full frontal attack. It was a sneak attack from the back. Now, you may know this already, or, or put two and two together, but Amalek, there's lots of pictures, right? The Bible's full of pictures. It's, it's full of, you know, we know like, such as the oil and water are often pictures of the Holy Spirit, and, and it's full of pictures. The um, leprosy is a picture of sin, right? You, you know, that's what I mean by pictures. So, 
the, the Amalekites and the Philistines for that matter, and a lot of these ites and steens that we see throughout the Old Testament are pictures of sin, but they're also pictures, in this case, the Amalekites are a picture of our flesh. They're a picture of our flesh. Um, what is our flesh? I mean, I guess the basic way to describe our flesh, you know, can, again, we can use that word in a very Christianese kind of way, not really understand what it means. Um, uh, but it means our old sinful nature. The old sinful nature of man that comes back. Man, or you know, your old sinful nature, whatever that sinful nature, whatever that is. It comes back. So Amalek is a picture of that flesh. So the Amalekites, in that excerpt I just read from Deuteronomy, they attack the rear. They pick off the people who are sick, feeble, or old. Look, you, you watch... I don't mean to... I, hope, I don't mean or hope to be flippant about this, but you watch the Discovery Channel, right? I mean, or National Geographic, or one of those, like those wildlife shows. And you see this happen. The, the pack animals, the ones that are old, the ones that are sick, the young tend to get surrounded by the healthy animals. The young kind of get protected. But it's often the old and the sick who straggle behind. And who does the lion pounce on? Every time, right? It's the young and that's who they get. They're not going to go after the healthy ones. They're too, they put up a, a fight. Why do that? So the lion, the predator, pounces on the weak and the sick. And that's what the, the Amalekites do. So they're picking off the weak and the sick. And that's exactly how our flesh works. That's exactly how our old sin nature works. It, it picks us off in the areas of our lives where we're weak, where we're feeble, where we're holding back. That's where our old sin nature moves in. So there's a picture there for us. There's a message there for us. Here God says, it's time to deal with these, with these Amalekites. It's time to deal with the flesh. Now, the context for Saul is, and for Samuel, is you know that I've said it before that I'm going to wipe out the Amalekites. I'm providing you with an opportunity to do it. Saul, King Saul, do it. You know my word says it. Now I'm giving you an opportunity to do it. The, the application for us is, is we have an opportunity each day to render the old man dead. To not allow our flesh to pick us off where we're holding back, where we're weak, where we're feeble. Second Corinthians, it says this, and I know you know it, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, because of what he did on the cross, because he died for all, one died for all, therefore, from now on, Christian, King Saul, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though as we have, we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we, know, we now know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the point of the flesh being rendered dead. Paul is just reminding us of the same principle being revealed to us here in 1 Samuel 15. Paul's just picking up the same principle and reminding us. So it might seem cruel or mean for God to call for the total annihilation of an entire people group, the Amalekites. But here's something to consider. The Amalekites... Because, and because I would suggest to you, they represent, they are a picture of the flesh. The Amalekites were so corrupt and so polluted with sin that they were actually destroying themselves. They were already in the process of destroying themselves. Sin and perversity. Does that sound at all like a society you know? <laughs> I mean, I chuckle too, but it's also sad. Because it's so true. We live, unfortunately, amongst the Amalekites. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God order annihilation of various tribes and people groups. And again, it's, it's tough to one hand in a sense to understand, but, but usually it's because those people groups are so polluted and corrupt with sin that it was actually 
an act of mercy by God. And again, I don't, this is a very simplistic analogy or picture, but I, and maybe it's just me, so if it doesn't work for you, then just disregard what I'm about to say. I, I'm an old, maybe I'm an old head too. I think of old Yeller. Remember old Yeller? He was, you know, the analogy doesn't fit perfectly because he was a brave, loyal dog and all that stuff. But at the end, you know, wh why did Travis go and do what he did to old Yeller? Because he loved him. You know, God, God wants that none should perish, right? He loves the Amalekites. But he loves them so much he doesn't want to see them destroy themselves in sin and perversity. You know, so that's a take. I'm not telling you that's doctrine, but that's a take. And, and I think that's what's going on here. So um, verse 6 says, says this. So it's all gathered. So he's, told, so he's told, annihilate them. Total judgment. That's what he tells Samuel, tells Saul via God to do. So Saul, verse 4, gathered the people together, numbered them in Tehillim, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah, good army. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, I'll destroy them, for you showed kindness to Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed. So um, he's a good, look, Saul's a good military leader. Even if he's being disobedient, he still has skills. He, still has, he, lays, he lies in wait. He, he knows how, to, how to, uh, to attack the Amalekites, maybe taking a page out of their book a little bit. So he lies in wait for them in the valley, it says there. And now this whole thing with the Kenites, you know, not to get into it too deeply, but you know, the Kenites, um, uh, God shows mercy to them here. And it says why, because they were good to the Israelites before. But the interesting connection, too, uh, if you want to go back, you see Jethro, who's the, who's the father-in-law of Moses, was a Kenite. So there's a connection, you know. So, um, but anyway, they, they were smart. Whatever the Kenites, whatever the purpose was, the Kenites were smart. They, they saw Saul's army. They knew they had, Saul's army had a reputation of being fierce and winning battles. They knew it wasn't going to be pretty. So they pulled up pe their, their, their tent pegs and they got out of Dodge. And that was smart. So that's what they do. So verse 7 says, and Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And they were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So, in verse 7, it seems like Saul is doing what he's told, doesn't it? Up to this point, it seems like he's following what, the, what Samuel told him to do. Um, for, you know, verse 7, Saul attacked the Amalekites, and which is east of Egypt. He attacked them. He did what he was supposed to do. Um, but in verse 8, things switch. Things change in verse 8. He goes astray from his command to destroy utterly. Not only Agag, but livestock too. You know, with plenty of other verses that, that, that pro, uh, provide us this, this idea, you know, judges, they, and, they, and they did again what was right in their own eyes, right? They're out judges that goes back and forth like that. Proverbs uh, 14, 12, uh, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. You know, there's always a way that seems right to a man. That's, that's what Saul's doing here. He's thinking with his flesh. Interesting kind of uh, literary juxtaposition. He's thinking with his flesh and he's fighting the Amalekites who represent flesh, you know, so he, he's, he's kind of doing like them. But he spared the livestock too. I'm like, look, uh, if I were him, I might be thinking similarly. Because I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm a military leader. When you defeat an enemy, you take the plunder. It's what you do. You know, I, I almost have, it doesn't tell us here, so I'm sort of creating this myself, but I almost feel like Saul's there going, um, remember what God said. Remember what God said. He said destroy utterly. Saul's going, wait a minute, but this is good stuff. We need, we could use this stuff. We could use this stuff to fight the next enemy for God's purposes. Right? That we can justify our own taking things into our own account. Right? We can justify it for God's purpose. I mean, think about, think about Paul, not to confuse things, but think about Paul when he, when he was Saul, the persecutor, didn't he think he was doing God's will? He was a Pharisee. 
He thought he was doing God's will. You know, so we can be deceived when we, when we take things into our own hands outside of God's will to think, well, I'm doing this is going to benefit God. You know, whatever that looks like for you. You know, I'm, I, you know, I know that I shouldn't be doing business with this guy, but if this deal pulls off and I can use that money, I'll tithe extra and then I'll send money to the missions. No. No. You know, if God, if God makes it clear to you, and I know you don't have Samuel at home, but you have this. And if God makes it clear to you that you shouldn't be doing something, or you should be doing something, you need to do it. The word agag means I will overcome. So, in a positive, like that, you know, taking that in a positive connotation, that's, that's good. I will overcome. Um, it's a good name for the king of the flesh, though. I will overcome. I will succeed. I will not be wiped out or removed easily. I think of Lucifer with the I wills as he gets cast from heaven. I will be like the Almighty. I will not be wiped out. So he's, he will overcome. The flesh says that to us. The flesh says, I will overcome. It's saying it to Saul in this situation. Saul knows what God told him to do, but the flesh says, I'm going to overcome what God told you to do. I'm going to overcome that. So here we see Agag is spared by Saul, which will prove to be a very costly ever, uh, error. Um, here, he did not utterly destroy the Amalekite. And years later, when Paul is, I'm sorry, when Saul is wounded on Mount Gilboa in battle against the Philistines. Again, the Philistines another the Philistines are another picture of sin. And, and and as I read it, the Philistines are a picture of that sort of that pesky sin that you just can't quite shake. It's not that like overwhelming burden of sin like, like many of us have, have have endured in our lives perhaps. But it's that pesky little sin, that one you can't quite shake, you know, like that kind of like ankle biter dog. Like just get out of here, you know, when you go for a walk and that thing comes barking at you, like, stop. You know, that's that's the Philistines. They, think about that in the Old Testament. They, they come back time and again and again. You can't shake the Philistines. So he gets killed by the Philistines. Saul himself, well, we know, I, I, I generalize there, he's in battle, he's, he's wounded, and he falls on his own sword, right? You know the story of how Saul dies. But do you remember who his sword bearer was? He was an Amalekite. He was an Amalekite. And later, that sword bearer, that Amalekite sword bearer, he comes back and tells David, and, David, and, and he tries to take credit for killing Saul, but it turns out he was blowing smoke. It wasn't real. But, but the, the point is, an Amalekite, the Amalekites who were supposed to be wiped out. Saul, years ago, before, you know, years before he dies, years before that, he was supposed to wipe out. In the, in the passage we're looking at here, he was supposed to wipe out the Amalekites. That's what God told him to do. He clearly had the, the resources to do it. It doesn't indicate in any way, shape, or form to me, anyway, that the Amalekites even put up a fight. He just he just went in and took care of business. All it talks about, he went into battle and then he's taking plunder. Doesn't sound like the Amalekites were much of a challenge to Saul and his army. And he's supposed to wipe him out, of course. And here we have an Amalekite who's playing a part in Saul's death. He's playing a part in Saul's death. One of those he was supposed to completely, a representation of the flesh, ends up playing a role in Saul's own death. What an illustration this is for us. If I don't kill the flesh, if I don't kill that old man, that old nature, sin nature that I have, the flesh will kill me. It'll take me out. He was supposed to annihilate the flesh in the Amalekites. And as he lays dying on Mount Gilboa, a representation of that flesh he was supposed to annihilate stood over him. It's a great picture. Saul thought he could control Agag. Of course, he takes his king, he takes his king prisoner, with all the great livestock and stuff it tells us. He takes him prisoner, and I'm sure Saul had complete control. He probably thought, look, what's this guy going to do? I could, yeah, I could probably get some intel. You know? 
I'm a, I'm a soldier. I can get some intel. I can figure out if he has any other troops out there. I can figure out if he's, in, if he's conspiring with any other tribes or any other nations. I can figure out all the kinds of things about how he, he maneuvered. I could figure It's good intel. This makes sense for me to take Agag. I have him under control. He's under lock and key. Nothing to worry about. But Agag's descendants eventually play a role in killing Saul and destroying Saul. So I think that if, if we think that because we have certain aspects of our flesh in chains, if we have certain aspects of our old sin nature under control, I'm using air quotes if you're not looking, that you don't have to worry, I say to you, watch out. I say to you, watch out. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. The old sin nature can't be controlled, brothers and sisters. It can't be controlled. You can't, you can't keep it at bay. You have to annihilate it. You have to render it dead. Now, for me, I don't know about for you. For me, I have to annihilate it every morning. I have to remember what Christ did for me on the cross. He became that Amalekite. He became that old sin nature that I have on the cross for me. And he annihilated it. I have to do that. I have to remember that every morning. Otherwise, I'll have agag in my life by about 2.30 in the afternoon. You know? Romans 6.11, reckon yourself dead to sin. That's what, that's what Scripture tells us. We're to reckon ourselves dead. Agag gave birth to one who would destroy Saul, or help destroy Saul, the Amalekite sword bearer who's there with him. And that under control fleshly desire in your life will give birth to other desires that will destroy you. Now, again, I'm not saying you're going to fall on your sword on Mount Gilboa. Okay? But what can it destroy? What can the flesh destroy? It's not, I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm not saying the, the old sin nature, the Amalekite, the flesh that, that might still exist in your life. I'm not saying it's going to make you unsaved. That's not the point. But what can it destroy? It can destroy your intimacy with your Creator. It can destroy how you seek Him. It can destroy your fellowship with brothers and sisters. It can destroy little bits of your walk with the Lord. And you guys know the enemy works like that. The enemy is like the Amalekites. The enemy is perfectly satisfied with picking off the weak and the feeble aspects of you. He knows he's got no chance if he, if he, if he goes nose to nose with you. Because you have Christ in you. So he picks off the weak and feeble parts of your life. So we have to render ourselves dead to sin. We have to shed, dismiss, eliminate, annihilate the notion that we have any part of our flesh under control. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You don't. Your flesh cannot be controlled. The principle of this passage is that it cannot be controlled your old sin nature can't be held at bay. It's got to be destroyed. Why else would God tell Saul to do it? If, if God knew that we, who are made in His likeness and His image, could manage our old sin nature, He wouldn't have said to Saul, completely eliminate the Amalekites, completely destroy them. He would have said, you know what? Kill a bunch of them, make your point, and then let them go. But he didn't say that. It must be destroyed. So how? How do you destroy it? You know, I talked a minute ago about how I do it every morning. Um, you know, I, I say a prayer every morning. Lord, um, I, I, I'm flawed. I, I, I've already made mistakes. I've already thought bad thoughts. Um, 
I've already done stupid things. Now, Lord, I'm about to roll out of bed, so please help me through the rest of my day. You know, that's kind of how my day starts. But with that notion, though, I, I do. I, I come before the Lord every morning. I just say, Lord, I believe what your word tells me about what you did on the cross. It's not just a, it's not just a concept. I, I, I have come to the point, and, I, and I'm, I'm encouraging you, brothers and sisters, to get to that point if you're not there yet. Know that you know that you know that Christ killed your old man. With everything that you are, believe that Jesus paid the price for your sins. That he became my sin, your sin, my flesh, your flesh, and nailed it to a tree. And that's where it should remain. When Christ died, my flesh died. When he rose, my new life in him began. The flesh fights hard to return. It does. It fights hard to come back into our lives. 200 years after Agag, 200 years plus, more than that, but 200 some years after Agag, after this passage that we're looking at here, a whole nation, the whole nation of Israel feels the ramifications of Saul's failure to deal with the flesh. So Saul felt it almost sort of personally when we saw the example of how there was a, an Amalekite who was with him as he died on Mount Gilboa, of course. But there was more. Um... You know the story of Esther, right? Right. You know the story of Esther. Do you know who what Haman is listed as when you read Esther? An Agagite. He's a descendant of Agag. So here, 200 plus years later, Haman, who's, you know the story of Esther. Haman wanted to annihilate the Jews. He wanted to eliminate them. He, wanted, he was determined to kill the Jews. Here we see a picture of the flesh makes an attempt to return in the, in, the, in the form of Haman. And that's why we have to remember to always turn to Christ. We can do like Saul and think we have our flesh under control, but we have to realize that, um, that our own failure to deal with it completely, and I'll add, Regularly. Daily. What does Paul say, right? I die daily. And that's what we're called to do. Die daily. Render it dead daily. And we'll have... Uh, uh, the ramific If we don't... We fail to deal with it daily. We fail to deal with it completely. Like Saul, we'll have those ramifications on, on us, perhaps, as Saul did on Mount Gilboa. Um, on our kids and our grandkids, perhaps. This Haman, 200 plus years later. I mean, I don't like to, to, to um, venture into what ifs um, and, and hypotheticals because we know that they're just hypothetical. But what if he had eliminated the Amalekites completely? How does that change the course of history in the Bible? How does it change? Does, is, is there a book of Esther even written? <laughs> is it even necessary? You know? So... We have to take this personally, apply this personally, and, 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 and I challenge you to think about the areas of your life where um, your flesh dominates. And it might be as small as, and I, I, I say this often, and I, I fall victim to it often in my flesh, but it might be as small as coming across an everyday problem, issue, whether it's work-related, family-related, relational-related, um, and just immediately jump to the notion like, oh, I've, I've dealt with this before. I've had, I've had this problem before. I've had something like this. I know how to handle this. That's my flesh. That's, that's me being a, 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 an Amalekite. That's my flesh speaking. You know, instead of pausing and saying, Lord, how would you have me handle this? How would you have me do this? Because I immediately think I can do it. Like, I, I've done this before. You know? So that's just one example of, of, of a way... Small way, my flesh kind of bubbles to the surface more often than I'd like to admit, quite frankly. Our friends can feel the ramifications if we don't 
completely and regularly deal with our flesh. Our neighbors and our church family. And sometimes it's years later. Um, so, when God says utterly destroy the, f- the flesh, we have to obey utterly. What we see here with Saul is that he did not obey utterly. Utterly means what? Completely. Totally. Absolutely. He obeyed partially. What does partial obedience get us? You know, I, I have, it, it's not, I guess it fits in with partial obedience, but I have a saying, my son, I, I, now I, I say, the, I begin it, my son finishes it. Um, I say, delayed obedience is disobedience. Because, um, my son has my genes. <laughs> Poor kid, right? My son has my genes, so he has a great, um, uh, aptitude to tune everybody out. He can, there could be mayhem going on in the house. If he's concentrated on something, he tunes everybody out. So I have to, Sam, take out the trash. Sam, put your shoes away. Sam, and I just walk in and say, delayed obedience. He pops up. It's disobedience. He jumps up and most of the time. Doesn't always jump up, but most of the time. But partial obedience, like we see here with Saul, is a similar principle. Partial obedience is disobedience. He mostly did what God asked him to do. God doesn't ask us to mostly do what he calls us to do. He asks us to fully do what he calls us to do. So let us not make that mistake. Partial obedience is disobedience. Now God is gracious. God is merciful. He's not going to utterly destroy us for our partial, diso- our partial obedience. But he will teach us lessons through it. He will teach us lessons. He will use it in our lives. So, whatever it is in your life, you know, make that application to whatever's going on in your life now. Where, where is God calling you? What is he calling you into? What is he calling you out of? And are you fully obedient to that? Or are you pulling a saw? I'm being partially obedient to it. I don't know the answer. I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody. I'm just asking you to think about that. Be challenged by that. Because we have a picture here of what partial obedience does. Delayed obedience in my house gets you a spanking. But Paul got, I mean, uh, Saul, sorry, got more than a spanking. Yeah. When God says, utterly destroy the flesh, when God says, whatever it is he's, he's asking you to do, and that's the one principle here, he's telling you to, to destroy whatever aspect of your life that's flesh-driven. He's telling you to destroy that. Don't do it partially. Do it fully. God will honor that. God will honor that. So, you can see where my, my titles were, death to the flesh um, or partial obedience, because both are true. God does call us to put it to death. Um, And he also calls us to be fully obedient. Both things are a challenge for me. I'm not, believe me, anybody who knows me a little bit knows that I'm not standing up here telling you I got it down because I don't. I I need to remember this each and every day. Um, My flesh is a bear. (laughs) And like my son, my obedience isn't always that great. So, um, so this was uh, a ministry to me, to myself, as, as any time I get the opportunity to teach the Bible, that's what it is first and foremost. It's, it's a ministry to Brian, so sorry. But this was for me, not for you. But um, hopefully it, it, it spoke to you. So um, I, I hope nobody's going to be terribly disappointed if we end a little early. Will you be? Okay, let's pray. Father God, Lord, we're just so grateful for who you are, Lord. We're grateful for the way you move in our lives, Lord. We are um, dumbfounded, Lord, by your grace and mercy. We're dumbfounded by how you love us unconditionally, despite the fact that we, we are often partially obedient, or we do uh, heed our own flesh. We go the way of our own thoughts, Lord. Um, we, we do what is right in our own eyes, Lord. But yet, there you are. 
there you are. Um, after, you, after you chastise us and, and, and reprove us, Lord, you're right there to comfort us at the same time, Lord. So, so we thank you for that, Lord. And, and, and Lord, help us to learn something from what we, we heard tonight, Lord. Um, convict us, encourage us. Do what it is you do through your word, Lord. Just um, draw us closer to you. Don't let our flesh get in the way. We want to be spirit-led, Lord. That's what you called us to be. Your spirit lives in us. It's not a concept that we just read on pages of a book. It's real. And your spirit is in us. Let us be led by that spirit. Not led by our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own experiences, but by you. So we thank you for that, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.